Tonight's program contains descriptions of child sexual abuse. Viewer discretion is advised. Funding for Frontline is provided by the Park Foundation, committed to raising public awareness. With additional funding for this program from the Jerome Foundation in celebration of the Jerome Hill Centennial. Frontline is made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Tonight on Frontline. All those years when I lived in silence, I believed that I was the only one. In recent decades, more than 10,000 children were reportedly sexually abused by Catholic priests. But years before the headlines, one family broke the story for themselves. For the 12 years since my brother told me, I've been wondering how he could have hit it so well, and where. Tonight, filmmaker Joe Coltrera and his brother Paul tell a very personal story. This was my first sexual experience. The story of a secret held for 30 years. I remember him saying, you don't tell anybody about this, this is part of your penance. Of the abuse of power. The church moved him around from parish to parish, and this guy was accused of molesting kids. And the triumph over betrayal. The game's over. You guys are not the ones who can preach to us. Tonight on Frontline, one family's encounter with the hand of God. All tapes. Take a look at these tapes. The title, see if you can remember. It says Paul. What's this one? Let's see if I can remember this. I remember places where it happened. I remember smells. I remember the sun coming through the, the rectory window. Uh, I remember the placement of the furniture in the, in the room in the rectory. I remember the red leather upholstery. I, for life of me, cannot remember how long it happened. My guess is it happened over the course of about four to six months between the spring and the summer in 64. There's parts that you just, you know, I think your subconscious protects you. It just kicks in, and, and you don't want to remember that. Uh, it's not the story of my life. It is a thing that happened to me. It's got to be confusing to people. People must wonder, how could you let this happen to you? Why didn't you tell somebody about it? Why didn't you stop it? Why didn't you walk out of the room? I think that... It's hard enough for me to understand how I, I let it happen to me. I mean, it's hard, you know, that's part of what I've sort of beat myself up for years. You know, I thought I'd let it happen to me. It's that whole power structure, that whole environment that we're in that allows this to happen, and hopefully something like this can, can explain that. This is my brother, Paul. My father, Paul. My grandfather, Paul. My name's Joe. You know, I don't, I don't like to be in films. <laughs> this is my mother, Josephine. Oh, God. Her father, Joseph. This is Nonna, my grandmother, Maria. My sister, Maria. Mary, mother of God. Here's how it all starts. Salem, Massachusetts, best known for its witchcraft trials and executions. Our small pocket of the city was an Italian neighborhood, close-knit, one house tied to the next, by clotheslines, by culture, by bonds of family and friendship. And in that neighborhood, a church, St. Mary's Italian, built in 1925 by the neighbors, a place where everyone met for religion and community, a tribute to lost loved ones. Down the street was our house, built by my grandfather Joseph, my mother's father, it's where we grew up and where my parents still live. 54, you weren't even born then. <laughs> this is Paul Maria. 
My sister Maria was ten years older than me, and my brother Paul nine. You lived in this house, and you came to know it intimately. On every spare wall, Jesus, Mother Mary, and the saints, keeping time, tracking our movements. In the hallway, popes and cardinals kept an eye on the door and the stairs. We lived up those stairs, where the saints made room on the walls for my father's paintings. It was a hobby he came home to after days of factory labor. In this house, there was comfort in details, familiar crevices and paint peels, family hiding places. For thirty years, my brother Paul hid a secret about something that happened to him in Salem, not far from here. Wait a minute, and for the twelve years since he told me, I've been wondering how he could have hid it so well, and where. And so I've been looking back at those hiding spots we both knew. And looking for other spots that Paul just kept to himself. There was a big Italian family. Our grandmother and a couple of our aunts and uncles lived downstairs. From time to time, there were various cousins and, and our older Sicilian relatives who were sharing the space. Nonna, she would talk to us in Italian, and she was a love. It was a wonderful, you know, childhood. Mom had seven brothers and sisters. You know, I'd say for the first ten years of my life, they all lived in that same house or within a block of each other. You were surrounded by family. It was very protective, very safe very nurturing. There were all these people who clearly loved you, and, and you were very much like them. Maybe the downside of it was that once you got out into a world where people weren't speaking that dialect and people weren't your family, yeah, you know, you could get into some trouble. first got married, my wife and I agreed that all my children had to have a, a Catholic education. The Italian church, St. Mary's, didn't have a school. And St. James, which was the Irish parish not that far away, they had a kindergarten through high school. I still dream that I'm in that school building. I was all nuns. There were no lay teachers back in those days. That dress is frightful enough in itself. If you came home and you said, oh, sister, somebody was yelling at me, it wasn't, what's wrong with sister, yeah, what's wrong with you, what did you do? As children, we were very passive, and we were just told to do it, we did it. The May processions, well, every year they would have this procession. they get every kid from kindergarten all the way up to the graduating girls in the senior class. A long line of kids. Each of their nuns would be standing next to them with a little clicker, keeping them in line. Some girl in the senior class, they'd pick the May Queen. They had these little page boys with a little blue beret-like puffy hat and a kind of little skirt-like thing. If you could get a kid to dress up like that, you could get a kid to do anything. There was the Catholic Church, and everything else was hell. Everyone beyond the bounds of the Catholic Church were doomed. Everything was presented to you in terms of sin. I remember these images of hell. Souls being tossed down into hell, and the flames coming up, and the devil being down there. The vision you had of life that you picked up early on was that you had to sort of tread a narrow path. There was a lot of things that you just shouldn't do, and if you did them and you had the misfortune of dying soon thereafter, you were going to be one of those souls that were being tossed down into the flames. So it was sort of this game that you played where you committed these sins, and then you'd go into the confessional on Saturday and reel off your sins, and the priest would say, yep, okay, you're safe, go. And uh, then you'd go out and do it again, and then you'd come back and say it again. I bought it hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> 